Good evening. This is Crime Classics. I am Thomas Highland with another true story of crime. Listen. That was Jacko. Jacko, the three-quarter Irish setter. A good dog, usually a well-behaved dog, friend to the children of Manchester Village, Vermont, an inquisitive dog. Whatever disturbs him isn't buried very deep. Listen to him digging. Smart dog. He's found what he was after. He's tugging at it. Gets it. Good dog. What have you got there, Jacko? A bone. Looks like a leg bone, doesn't it? A human leg bone. Tonight, my report to you on the Bourne Brothers and the Hangman, a study in nip and tuck. Crime Classics. A series of true crime stories taken from the records and newspapers of every land, from every time. Your host each week, Mr. Thomas Highland, connoisseur of crime, student of violence, and teller of murders. Now, once again, Mr. Thomas Highland. They were fighting battles on Lake Champlain in 1812, but across the state, forests away and mountains apart, the village of Manchester sent peaceful fans of chimney smoke into the February air. It was ebb of winter and edge of spring. It was snow flurry and thaw and chill sunlight. Here, the Battenkill River flowed swift and dark down from the green mountains and crusted icily near its banks and past the village, then flowed swift and dark away. And where the snow had melted, the soil glistened and was rich and black. Farmhouses gleamed white. And where the furrow began, the shallow furrow that deepened and roughened and slowly rose up the mountainside and became the gorge that cut across the face of Mount Equinox. Where it gently began was the backyard of the house of Russell and Sally Colvin. And inside it... He's sleeping. Asleep? Why? Why asleep? Shh. What did you put him to sleep for? Please. There's moonlight on the snow and there's moonlight on the mountain and I promised my son he'd see. Why do you do that? Why do you fill his mind with lies and fancies? There's little men on the mountain tonight and I told my son he'd see them. Uh, Lewis! Don't wake him, Russell. Don't wake him. Stop hanging in on my arm, woman. Russell! Stop hanging in on my arm! <laughs> Son, I'll bundle you, and it's up the mountain we'll go tonight with you riding my shoulders. And little men we'll find. Them at their bowls and singing and dancing. And we'll join them. Come with me, son. Up the path the moonlight makes on the mountain snow. Up the path the moonlight makes. <laughs> knows this is an upsetting experience. And as Sally Colvin knew, this was not the first experience of its kind. Sometimes her husband would hoist her son on his back and walk away from the house and not come back for days at a time. And when they did, they would smile at each other secret smiles and say nothing of where they had been. And there were secret words between them that Sally could not understand and signs and small patterns of dance and then great bursts of laughter. And this time... The time when Russell took his son up the path the moonlight made, and they returned two days later. Where have you been? In heaven's name, where have you been? Shh. He's sleeping. Now you'll sleep the day away and the night. <laughs> the sun. And dream of the fancies we've seen in the little men. Sleep. Sleep. Tell me, tell me what... Shh. 
Oh, sister, oh, come in. What can I do for you in the morning? Hold me. Hold me. Oh, oh sister. Sister to me, what troubles you? <laughs> Him again? Your husband? Yes, oh, yes. And what? What he's doing to my son. Soon, soon. What? My son will become as mad as my husband. They speak of creatures in the mist in the gorge. And starbursts and moon. Brother. Brother Stephen Bourne. What do you want me to do? I don't know. I don't know. Well, he's a stronger man than I. There's not much I can do. But you and our brother Jesse Bourne, together you could do it. Don't speak to me of Jesse, him that I hate. But me. What of me? Speak no more of it. Save me. Save me, Stephen Bourne. That's what I ask of you. Sister. Save me. How? Very well, you know how. You and Jesse, you know it and you have said it. Come with me to our brother's forge and make peace and save me, your sister. I'm no blacksmith, Jesse, and I've not got the sinews of you, but listen to your sister and what her trouble is, or I'll try you. Will you now? Will you? Oh. Me, you can split your head to your heart in a stroke. Try me, will you? Then do it. Stop it! Stop it! Listen. Listen to me. I'm being killed, and my death is the madness around me. What are you saying? Of a husband. Let her say it. And what he does to my child... I've heard strangenesses in the village of your husband, sister. And when I've heard them, I've smiled to myself in remembering. This is the man you needed to marry, sister. Would die without, sister. And now he's a daft and a loon. Now he's... Hear her, hear her out. Say on, sister. He takes Lewis with him on walkings. For days. And they return. And there are secrets and madnesses. And loneliness for you. I care nothing of it. I care only for my son. Jesse. Jesse. Take his hand, Jesse Bourne, and be brothers again. For there is a bond now. The need to help me. Yes. And now listen to me. There where the ravine starts. By the field where it is rocky. I will send my husband there. A plotter, our sister. I will send my husband there tomorrow in the morning. Will you be there? Will the both of you be there? We'll be there. Now, hear to me, son, the way I do it. Come a goblin, come a teeny, come an elfin, come a greeny, come about, come about, come about all, and you shall... Russell. I'll finish it for you later, son. Russell. Russ... There you are, with your son mute and agape at you again. What do you want? It's a new morning and the new season of spring's coming in with it. And so? And so there's work. And you need not tell me of it. There's no work I do not do on this farm. I need no telling of it. In the upper field and where the rocks are easy to pull from the ground now that the thaw has softened it. I know of it. You need not remind me. Tonight the night frost may harden the ground again. I know it. I know it. Then go. I'll be back, son. Think hard of the verse I taught you. (laughs) 
And away he went, did Russell Colvin, on this new morning toward the upper field. He'd not gone 20 yards when he stopped. Gold. Sparkle of sun on Vermont granite. Small pool of sparkle. Gold. And he picked it up and put it in his pocket. Then on again, the long way around, through the grove of naked spruce, to give throat to the new season. And on and on to the brook now, and stop beside it, and kneel beside it and listen. Yes. Yes. Then through a thicket and into the upper field and the surprise in store for him. Oh, Russell. Hello, Jesse Boyne. Stephen. Oh, brother-in-law. What do you hear? To help you, Russell. To do what? To help you clear the rocks now that the ground is soft with thaw. And how do you know I'm here to do that? How indeed. I need not your help. I'm hearing you do, brother-in-law. I'm hearing that way, too. We're in hearing you don't do well by our sister, Russell. That's what we hear most of. And who's saying that? Our sister, your wife's saying it, Russell. More wife than sister, so it's not of your business. So it's off the land with you, the two of you. Oh, now, indeed. What you have to in that branch for, Stephen? I'm aiming to brain you with it. You are aiming the same, Jesse? Going to help. Then let's get to it, and we'll see. Let's get to it, indeed. Stephen Bourne used the branch as a club, and with excellent teamwork, he and his brother Jesse won the fight. You are listening to Crime Classics and your host, Thomas Hyland. Tomorrow evening, CBS Radio invites you again to mystery and intrigue, enhanced by the presence of Miss Marlena Dietrich. This Thursday, Miss Dietrich's adventure leads her to a little town in southern France, where stories of buried treasure have been bruited loudly enough to gather rapscallions of reprehensible inclination from all corners of Europe. Time for Love is heard tomorrow evening on most of these same stations. And now, once again, Thomas Highland in the second act of Crime Classics and his report to you on the Bourne Brothers and the Hangman. A study in nip and tuck. It was a good spring... April of 1812 was the gentlest in the memory of those who lived on the soft shoulder of Mount Equinox in Vermont. There were rumors of marchings and torch and war outside, but no one paid much attention. They were more important things, church, crops, and children, living to be done in the green mountains, the crackling air to be breathed, roam away through the soft fall of twilight and press a cheek against the warmth of an animal. Wondrous sunsets and tomorrow a wondrous dawn. Good place and good time, this valley. And one morning, as a matter of fact, on the morning after the Bourne brothers had done an errand for their sister. Come in. Oh, good morning, Mrs. Wyman. And to you, Mrs. Colvin. A sweet morning. It is. And what may I do for you? It's Wednesday. And so it is. So I've come again so your mister can drive me to the village again. He to shop for you and me for mine. He's not here. Oh, no. In the field, then? Not in the field. Oh, of course he is not, for I saw your son Lewis at play just outside the door, and he would be in the fields with his daddy dear, were his daddy dear in the fields. You'll be late to market, Mrs. Wyman. Where's the dear man, your husband, Mrs. Colvin? Gone. Where gone? To the mountain. Oh? I think. And when will he return? I don't know. Oh, 
such a dear man. And the dear fancies he sees and tells you of. Ah, what a fortunate woman you are, Mrs. Colvin. I've cleaning to do, Mrs. Wyman. Busy you are, I know, Mrs. Colvin, preparing supper for you and your beautiful child. But it's a month since the village has seen your husband last. And for the last week it's been raining. And if the dear Mr. Colvin is in the mountains, as you say... What then, Mrs. Colvin? What then? Maybe. Maybe. Maybe what? Maybe he has gone to war. <laughs> It's a year now, Mrs. Colvin. Have you heard from the dear man? Ah, it's a cruel war. I came to wish the all of you... You, Mrs. Colvin, and you, Stephen Bourne, and Jesse Bourne, a happy new year to you. May 1817 be a blessing to all of you. And to you, Mrs. Wyman. Happy new year, Mrs. Wyman. Happy new year. And a pity Mr. Colvin's not here. I suppose he'll never return now, will he? Stop your crying, Sally. Boys, a boy. Only fourteen. My son, Louis. I run off to join the militia. What's that? It's most what all boys doing now. Maybe I've failed. What are you saying, sister? Maybe the whole thing was done wrong. What wrong? Seven years since he's had no father. Maybe his father should have been close to him. The loneliness and... again, sister. Or my son. <coughs> What's the outcry? See what, Stephen? Ho, oh, Stephen Bourne. What is it, Sheriff Skinner? See there, a fire to Dr. Glazier's barn. Fetch a bucket in quick. Yes. Jesse, there's a fire to Dr. Glazier's barn. You surely know the barn, Jesse. Fire! Oh, fire! <laughs> And in 1819, fires were not very easy to control. It was a matter of having enough men and enough buckets to reach from the fire to the stream. And Dr. Glazier's barn was not notably close to the stream. Nor were there enough men nor buckets. So... The fire had its own way. It burned the barn to the ground. And later, when the ashes had cooled and while Sheriff Skinner was consoling Dr. Glazier on his loss... The sheriff's dog... Ah, what you digging they are, Jacko? Ah, find something, Jacko? Bring it here, Jacko. Ah, let's see what you got there. A bone. Funny-looking bone, big bone. What kind of bone would you say this was, Dr. Glazier? Leg bone. Human. Don't say. Not positive. Could be, though. 
Let's take a look, Jacko, where you found this bone. Ah. Hand me that stick of wood, will you, Doctor, so I can make this hole a little bigger. Where I used to store my potatoes to keep them from freezing. Uh Uh-huh. Huh. Huh. A button now. And look here, a knife. Funny-looking knife. Let me see it. I know the knife. Truth now. Whose? Russell Colvin's knife. Russell Colvin now. He's not been around. Six years, seven. It's his knife, all right. And that's a button off his coat, too. And this is a human leg bone, you're saying, Doctor? I'm not saying it's not a human leg bone. Let's get along, Jacko. Come on, come on, boy. A few words about Sheriff Silas Skinner. A good man had been sheriff of the county for nearly 20 years, and there wasn't a man who could say he hadn't got a fair shake from old Silas, or woman either. An honest man with no bias nor prejudice. A direct man. Where's your husband, Sally? Why, I don't know. A man of few words. You kill him? No. Who killed him, Sally? My brother Jesse killed him, Sheriff. A cautious man. Maybe he did, and maybe he didn't. But I'm arresting you till I find out which. A man of his word. Jesse? Yes, Sheriff? You kill your brother-in-law, Russell Colvin? No, Sheriff, I did not. Who did? My brother Stephen did. Maybe he did and maybe he didn't. But I'm arresting you till I find out which. Sheriff Silas Skinner sees it through. Stephen? Yes, Sheriff? I locked up your sister and I locked up your brother. And I'm putting you behind bars, too. On what charge, Sheriff? For murdering. Murdering who? Russell Colvin. I didn't murder him, Sheriff. Jesse said you did. Jesse's lying. I've known Jesse for long. He don't lie. He's starting to now when he says I murdered. You didn't murder him by yourself. That's what you're saying, isn't it, Steve? I'm saying that right enough. Your sister have anything to do with the murdering? Not that I know of. I'm going to tell you something, boy. What? I'm going to tell you something, son. What? You say to me what happened, it'll be easier for you. What do you mean? A little jail, that's all. No hanging. There's a handshake that goes with it? There is indeed. Here's my hand, Sheriff. And mine. Now, how was it done, son? How was it done, boy? Russell Colvin was on his rocky upper field... And that's where you done it, son? And my brother got on one side of him. I got to the other. And that's how you done it, boy? I hit him with a tree branch. And Jesse with his fist? That's right. That's right. And that's the way you killed him? Yes, sir. Then you took him to another farm? Doc Glaciers. And to that barn? Doc Glaciers. And buried him? Yes, sir. We'll write this out, son, and you'll sign it, won't you, boy? Just a little jail? Boy, son. Just a little jail. I shook your hand. Then I'll sign it. Good boy. No! No, no! Oh, stop taking on so, no. Stephen Bourne. Your brother Jesse's not acting up the way you are. They found us guilty. Well, you confess. And they're gonna hang us. You said just a little jail. You said no hanging. I did what I could. You said no hanging. Now you listen to me. You killed your brother-in-law and you confessed to it and you had a trial by jury and they found you guilty. And the judge said hanging. Now that's the laws applied to you and your brother. So don't carry on. Let's do a thing, Sheriff. What thing? Put an advertisement in the newspapers. An advertisement for what? For Russell Colvin. Put a description in. And say, life depends on him turning up. You crazy? You killed him. You confessed you killed him. Who knows of Russell Coven? Whether killed, he stayed killed. He and his moonlight little people. Do it. Now, don't order me, son. Please. Huh? Please do it. Well, all right, son. I have a copy here of the Rutland Herald, a newspaper of the time which was circulated throughout this area of Vermont. 
I would like to read to you a classified ad which appeared in the issue of November 26th, 1819. Printers of newspapers throughout the United States are desired to publish that Stephen Bourne of Manchester in Vermont is sentenced to be executed for the murder of Russell Colvin, who has been absent about seven years. Any person who can give information of said Colvin may save the life of the innocent by making immediate communication. Colvin is about five feet five inches, light complexion, light colored hair, blue eyes, and about 40 years of age. Why, that sounds like our hand, Russell, except it doesn't say about a boy being with him. Hmm. Well, I'll see if it is. Russell! Russell, now! What was you doing, Russell? Talking to my boy, Lewis. Your son, ain't he? My son. They're looking for a man named Russell in Manchester. Oh? It's going to be a hanging unless they find a man named Russell. Russell Colvin. You once said you was from Manchester. I am. They looking for you? I'm Russell Colvin. It's my duty to see you get back to Manchester, Russell. Mm, yes, it is. And so, two days before the scheduled hanging, Russell Colvin again appeared in Manchester. And the Bourne boys were not hanged. They were set free. What about the bone? Well, it was never proven to be a human bone. And the knife and button, Russell's, how had they gotten there? Russell always smiled when he was asked that. And what did his wife say to all this? You can come home if you want. I don't want you no more. I hear our son's with you. Yes, ma'am, he is. How did he find you a hundred miles away? Oh, the little people told him where I was. Them that lives on the path the moonlight makes. They told him. According to the report I have right here. In just a moment, Thomas Highland will tell you about next week's crime classic. The Bourne Brothers, tonight's crime classic, was adapted from the original court reports and newspaper accounts by Morton Fine and David Friedkin. The music was composed and conducted by Bernard Herman, and the program is produced and directed by Elliot Lewis. Thomas Highland is portrayed on radio by Lou Merrill. In tonight's story, Virginia Gregg was heard as Sally, Lamont Johnson as Russell, William Conrad as Stephen and Jack Crucian as Jesse. Featured in the cast were Irene Tedrow, Joseph Kearns, and Herb Butterfield. Bob Lamont speaking. Here again is Thomas Highland. Next week, London, England, in the year 1722. We will concern ourselves with the strange behavior of an escape artist. He robbed women and escaped from their men. It's listed in my files as The Incredible History of John Shepard. Thank you. Good night. Stay with CBS Radio right now, and you're guaranteed a ringside seat for the Archie Moore Joey Maxim Championship fight in Miami. Yes, right after station identification, most of these same stations will bring you Joey Maxim's bid to KO Archie Moore and regain the world's light heavyweight crown. The exclusive radio broadcast in just a moment. Mr. Keene, Tracer of Lost Persons, is heard Friday nights on the CBS Radio Network. <laughs> 